All right, welcome back. We're going to start session two of healing training. First of all, who drew, Who came the longest? I don't know how to, who, uh, who's like 20 miles away? Who's like, that, where y'all from? Oh, yeah, they did. All right. Luke, can you give this book to them? It is a Smith Wigglesworth devotion. It's one of my favorite devotions. All right. Let's get started. Session two, uh, we're going to talk about faith and some sacred cows. And as we go through the word, there's going to be things that pop up that are that we'll touch on that are sacred cows, and you'll see that in just a minute. Um, and as I'm giving a testimony, uh, go to Matthew 8, 5 through 13, and it's the Roman centurion. If you remember that story, then Jesus heals his servant. So we're going to talk about that. Uh, what faith is, and does a person have to be there, and authority, and things like that. Not working. Right, we're going to try one more time. Let me get this going. Right. Well, for those on Facebook Live, if you can't hear me, Turn your volume up. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, but we're taping this on video so you can go to our YouTube channel this week or so and, and see them. And also, uh, please go to John J. Lake Ministries and look up their Divine Healing Technician, DHT. There's several of them out there. They're free. It's a three-day conference of, of this type of thing, and this is what we learned. So uh, if you want more, which I highly suggest is, is to do that, uh, John J. Lake Ministries, Divine Healing Training. Okay, um, I'm not. All right, praise God. All right, so as you're going to Matthew 8, 5 through 13, that's the uh, one about the Roman centurion. Um, all right, so to kind of clarify, God is not in control. Because <laughs> I know it's a, it's a touchy subject. So we're in partnership with him. The New Covenant talks about being in partnership with him. And so that that's the control. He He, he has to have physical people on earth to do stuff. And so he's, in a sense of not controlling, but influencing his believers to do what? Bring heaven to earth. What's God's will? Bring heaven. To earth. That's the prayer. So we're bringing heaven to earth. And so we do that through the power of his Holy Spirit, the authority of Jesus' name. And then Jesus, who is the righteous son, uh, who, who brought in the new covenant, bringing his will. So it's not about being in control. It's bringing his will onto the earth. Uh, and we're going to talk about salvation in the sense of being born again versus healing. You can't make anybody get saved because it's if it's a free choice, but you can get people healed even if they don't want to be healed. Because it's not about them, it's about the enemy oppressing them. So whether it's cancer or leukemia or a stub toe or whatever it is, the enemy is oppressing them. My beef is not with the person, I'm trying to get them free. I have power and authority over the enemy who's bringing those things. And so that's how it works. I've seen Buddhist people healed. I've seen atheists healed. I've seen Christians who didn't want to get healed healed. So it's not about the person's will or believing or agreement or anything like that. You're getting the person free of whatever. So if the person's dead, are you trying to ask them, hey, do you believe in divine healing? And God can raise... No, you just raise them up because it's not about them and their belief system. It's about you, your belief system, and the covenant that you're in. So... Uh, real quick, uh, Matthew 8. So I'm just going to come out punching with the dead raising testimony. I can give you tons of different ones. So this is about three of them into it. So the ones that I saw when I was with the fire department, because I saw lots of dead bodies and stuff like that. So um, this is one of my victories after having 60 or 70. Nothing happened. Praying for people looking stupid and foolish and, you know, kneeling next to a person who's overdosed on drugs or whatever. And having all the faith and having all the right thing and just not happening for whatever reason. And we'll talk about when these things happen. What do you do? What do you think about? Um, so this is about three of them into it. So I, I share this testimony just to give you a, this is how it works. And this is my mentality of what I'm doing when I'm praying for people, especially the dead. Um, so if you study how Jesus did it, he either touched the person or spoke to them, one or the other. So you can do the same. You can speak to it, speak to them, or you can touch them. And several of them I spoke to, and they got up. And this one I'm going to share, 
I didn't say anything. I just touched the person. This is, and I've seen, when this happened, I had seen a couple more. I've seen a couple of dead raisins. So I was like, you know, give me somebody, give me a dead person. <sighs> and I was just very eager for this to happen. So um, in the fire department, we get, um, I'm just kind of goofy that way. Um, being a fireman, I just like to, not, not that you want to see people in trouble, you want to help them, but I like the blood, teeth, hair, and eyeballs and stuff like that. It's just part of being, I guess, a fireman and how we think, but you want to be there to help people. Anyway, so the lights and sirens and going to a fire, and I, I love running into burning buildings. I'm just kind of wired that way. Uh, it's just fun to me. I like confronting Muslims with machetes. I mean, it's just kind of my thing. Anyway, um, so <laughs> we get the call. Um, we get the call, and it's it, it, on our outreach. It's in that area, actually, where we do our outreach. Uh, we get a call to a house, and the call comes in as a drug overdose. Sometimes you get a call that's person down. You don't know what's going on. But this was this person had it was a drug overdose. We're, we're going there, and the call comes. You know, on the radio it says massive overdose, probably cocaine. We're like, great. Um, so we get there. We get to the scene. And with the fire department I was with, uh, you have the fire, you have the fire truck, we're paramedics and EMTs, you have the ambulance crew, and you have the police. That's all going to these scenes. We get there, we're the third ones in. So the police, I get to this, we get to this house, we go in, the police are there, so there's two cops, the medic crew is there, there's four medic ambulance people, and there's four firefighters. The mom, and I'll just say it like this, the girlfriend of the girl. And in the living room was this lady on her back with all this white dust all over her face from cocaine overdose, and she's dead. And I'm always the one that's going to check out vitals and make sure they're dead, and they're not just a little dead, but they're dead dead. So, I, so I'm going into this scene. I'm like, another dead person. So I'm thinking, how do you do ministry and work kind of at the same time? So I'm trying to, I'm trying to do all these things. And my thought process is, if I can just touch her, the Holy Spirit can do awesome stuff. That's, that's what I'm thinking. Because Jesus either touched them or he spoke to them. And so the first two, I spoke to them, and they were raised from the dead. So I was like, try something new. And not that I wouldn't pray in front of people, I would. But in this case, I was like, all right, I'm just going to do my job. I'm going to check for vitals. Uh, she had no heartbeat. Uh, she was not breathing. She had pinpoint pupils, which means she had overdosed. It was obvious. And for <laughs> some reason... I get out the blood pressure cuff and I start <laughs> taking her blood pressure. This person's dead. She's like, I have a blood pressure. So I'm doing the blood pressure cuff. I'm like, in my mind, I'm thinking, all right, I'm touching her, you know, getting the blood pressure, holding her hand, checking for a radial pulse. As I'm thinking this, I'm thinking, Holy Spirit, you can do, you can do awesome stuff. So that's what's going through my head as this is happening. So I'm taking the blood pressure. I, I get no blood pressure. It's a no brainer. And... <laughs> Uh, there's like nine, ten people in, in, in watching this. So I said to our lieutenant, I was like, you know, there's no signs of life. Um, I'm just going to check her radial pulse one more time. And so I'm on my knees, and I'm, I go to touch her arm again, checking for a radial pulse. And it's going... <laughs> her pulse starts. She's starting to have a pulse. I'm like, well, I, I, just, I don't know what I said. I was like, oh my gosh. And then as I'm checking the pulse and standing up, she stands up, kind of dusts herself off, walks over to the couch, sits down and says, I'm fine, I'm fine. And we, we had the same look y'all did. It was like, and like on cue, the, all, fi all the firefighters, just, we just went, grabbed our bags and walked out. We didn't know, it, it was so surreal, we didn't know what to do. And a lot of times we work with the same crews, whether it be police or medic crews, and I'll ask them a lot of times, what happened? You know, what, you know, what happened after we left or whatever? And they said they took her to the hospital and cleaned her up and her vitals were fine. And we don't know what happened. It, there's no explanation because this person who was dead just got up. It's awful quiet in here. I mean, it's just God's power is just absolutely amazing. I can give you four or five other stories like that. But that was one of the dead raisings. And, my, and the thought process is, speak to it or touch them. It's, it's really that easy. Now, what is the problem? I can, I can hear y'all thoughts already. I can hear them. It's all that. It's all this questions and what this and what that. When we clear up the questions, you'll be able to do that. 
because there will be no, no blockage of the Holy Spirit going out and touching people and raising them from the dead or healing them. It's really that easy. Is it really that easy just to touch somebody and get them healed? Yes. Problem is delivering the Holy Spirit from us to them. Anybody have a garden hose at the house? If you have a garden hose, and I was going to save this for tomorrow, but this is spirit, soul, and body. How it works is, at your house, do you have water going to your house? It's a 100%. Bam, you have all this water at your house. So you have your little green little spool, and it's all nice, and you water your garden and stuff like that. So you have this hose. What do you got to do to get to get the water into the hose? Go to the side of the house and crank the little thing, and it comes on and trickles out. And in mine, it just, I need a new hose. Anyway, so you have this hose, and you have the little gun thing, the little gripper thing. What do you got to do to get the water that's 100% fully in the house, come on, there's no metaphor or simile that's going to explain this, that's in this house, through this hose out to where you need it to go. You squeeze. What happens inside that little nozzle when you squeeze? It opens. It's from a closed position to a open position. It's usually a ball and socket, but sometimes it's different. Anyway, you want that open all the way to get all the water that's 100% in your house that's already there, that's been filled up and given to you, they have been on cost through you to the outside world. That's what's inside of you. That goes through your soul. What you believe is what's going to happen. Okay? That's what my renewal is. It's opening, it's squeezing that handle and letting that gate open to let the, the, the water, come on, the Holy Spirit, out. That's all that's happening. So you need to, we need to clean up and not unbelieve false things, but believe right things. The more you believe the right things and renew your mind, the more that gate opens up and the Holy Spirit is able to go do stuff. Amen? Amen. Yeah. It's that easy. So how do you do that? We'll talk about that. You're doing it tonight. So has, have you been learning things? Yeah. Have you been seeing things in scriptures that you haven't really seen or believed or understood kind of before? All right. But that's my renewal. Your mind is being renewed, and it's opening up, and when you pray for people, that 100% of Holy Ghost is going, is going to touch them. Amen? Amen? Amen. All right. Matthew 8, verses 5 through 13. Everybody there? Say, oh me or am I? All right, now when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came with him, pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home, paralyzed and dreadfully tormented. Uh oh. And Jesus said, I will come and heal him. All right, a couple of things here. Centurion is in not, not in covenant. He is like the enemy, he's a Roman centurion. Is he in covenant with God? Yeah. No. What did Jesus do? Let's go, let's go to your house. It wasn't like he didn't give him, you know, 12 questions and Barbara Walters, 20 questions and all this and excuses. He, let's go to your house. That's the first thing out of his mouth. Let's go to your house. Let that sink in just a minute. All right. Um, and so the ser where's the servant? <clears throat> where's the sick person? At, house. At the house. How far away is the house? Don't know? Don't care. Distance. So the Sertarian's there. Jesus is there. The sick person is somewhere else. Let's see what happens. Uh, I've seen this movie before. I know how this ends. All right, the centurion asked and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak the word. How does Jesus heal? Speak the word or touch. Speak your word and my servant will be healed. Was the servant there? What kind of belief system did the servant have? Don't know. He didn't even know that the centurion and Jesus are meeting. He's homesick, tormented, and paralyzed. Uh oh. You smell that? The sacred cow is being burned. <sighs> uh, love it. All right. Speak the word, and my servant will be healed. This is a picture of authority. This is how. It works. Pastor Russell, how did you raise the dead? This is how it works. 
For I also am a man under authority, having soldiers under me, and I say to this one, go, and he goes. To the other one, come, and he comes. To my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed, Assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith. Underline great faith. There's a reason. Not even in Israel. I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and sit down at Abraham with Isaac and with Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into utter darkness and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. There is a hell. I'll make that clear. It's not for us. All right. Rabbit trail. When Jesus said to the centurion, go your way. As you have believed, so let it be done to you. And the servant was healed when? That same hour. All right, that will destroy a bunch of sacred cows. That's how authority works. You say it, and it's done. Jesus said, I have given you all power and all authority. Is it your authority? It's his. It's his name. So you're a sheriff's deputy. You're not the sheriff, but you've been deputized with a badge and a gun. Badge represents authority. You have the authority to pull somebody over and give them a ticket. You don't pull them over in the name of John Smith. You pull them over in the name of the city of Richmond or the county of Powhatan. You have been given authority with something greater. If they don't pull over, you know, cap a fool. I'm just kidding. You, you have a gun. I'm just, I'm just kidding. You have a gun to enforce that. Is a joke. You have a gun to enforce that law or that authority or whatever. That makes sense? Badge, gun, authority, power is the same thing. That's how this works. I, in my own power, cannot raise the dead, heal the sick, or cast out devils. But guess what? I have his authority, the name of Jesus, and the power of the Holy Spirit to do those things. And you do too. Believers, not doubters, believers will do these things. All right? All right, what else can we say? All right, so when you pray for somebody, does the person have to be there in your vicinity? No. no. So you can't lay hands on them. They're not there. But you can say something. You can type something. I've typed a prayer, and they were healed of diabetes. That was pretty cool. Where do you get that from? Jesus said, you're going to do what I did and greater things. Jesus didn't have a computer and couldn't email. He said, you're going to do greater things. Okay. How's it work? Authority. Belief? Authority? Over email? Over email, over the phone. I've prayed for people over the phone. Someone called me and they, their friend was on the phone and they said they wanted to be delivered. They had schizophrenia, bipolar, they weren't saved, and some other physical things. I said, give me the phone, I'll pray for them. Prayed for them, got them healed of whatever physical thing. I don't remember what the physical things are. I cast the devil out. They were, they were free from schizophrenia, bipolar. I got them saved. I, I, I gave them the salvation message. They got saved. And they got filled with the Spirit speaking in tongues in 10 minutes. It's a simple gospel. It's a powerful gospel. Amen? All right. I forget where they It was one of Theo's friends. I think they were in Maryland or something like that. Point being, does the person you're praying for have to be there? No. What is the belief system of the person you're praying for? Doesn't matter. If they have faith, great. Add to the faith. But most people you're praying for aren't going to have that. And it's okay. I don't ask them. I don't ask them, what's your faith level today? And <laughs> one out of ten. I feel like a seven. I don't know if God's going to heal you. And I, don't, I don't ask any of those things. And you're going to see tonight and tomorrow how we pray for people. I have faith. All right? If you have faith, great. But I'm, I'm going to pulverize this thing that's attacking you. That's what's going to happen. And the devil's going to leave. And, we're going to, and then the shouting is going to begin. Amen? All right. Any questions on that? So centurion, authority. Um, the reason I had you underline great faith, there's only two places in the Bible where it says great faith. This one in the Syrophoenician woman. She is not in covenant. They had great faith because they're not Jewish. <laughs> they're not in covenant. Go figure. I don't know how to end that because it's like it doesn't matter what the person believes. Or we, we prayed for a Buddhist lady who had ischemia, like it was, it looked like leather. Prayed for her. she was healed within about a week or so, and gave her life to the Lord. She had no zero belief. Wanted to be prayed for, but zero belief. Buddhist. 
not covenant, not believer. Do I have a beef with her? No, I have a beef with the devil. It's called ischemia that's ravishing her skin. Go in Jesus' name, skin be healed. Guess what? A week later, he was healed. Amen? Don't I make this seem like really easy? It's hard. It's hard in the beginning because there's, there's a lot you have to overcome. So you, you all see me now. You see us now, 13 years later. You don't see me in Chuck E. Cheese parking lot. You don't see the first time in Walmart making an absolute fool of myself. And I'm, I'm, I'm a fool of myself. No one getting healed. The person, got, I think they, they left even more hurt than they came in. It was just it's ridiculous. But keep praying, keep pushing. And then like popcorn, people get healed, 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 and it gets bigger and bigger and more and more and more. The kingdom of God is like a, it's like a tree where birds of the air come and it just grows. It starts out small and it grows. So my, my advice is start this. You all have a heads up because you have people to talk to. I didn't have anybody to talk to. I, saw, I listened to a pirated MP3 of the DHD from John J. Lake Ministries that someone sent to me. I listened to it. I just chose to believe it and chose to go do it. I had no one to talk to. I was trying to look at Todd White on the internet. How does he do this? What is he saying? Why is it so easy for him? I didn't have that. So I, just, I, ha I have this so deeply because I had to. I'd come home some nights and just be like, God, what is going on? And most of the time he'd be like, just keep going. And he would answer my question either through the word or through the teaching. And now I don't have any questions. I, I understand it. It took time though. Amen. All right, 1 Peter, go to 1 Peter 1, 3 through 5. <clears throat> 1 Peter 1, 3 through 5. And His divine power has given us some things. No, in His divine power He has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who has called us by glory and virtue, by which we have been given exceedingly... Great and precious promises that through these you may be you may be partakers of the divine nature. Who's in control? God gave it to us. We're partakers of this divine nature to go lay hold of, dominate, subdue, take authority over the earth. Not over people, but over the earth. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Alright, a couple things. He's given us all things. He's like a, if, if you're here and you believe in Jesus, and you've been filled with the Spirit, speaking in tongues, He is not going to give you anything else. You have it all. You just have to use what you have and give it out. Amen? You don't, there's no special anointing. You're not going to find special anointing in the New Testament. You're not going to find it. There's no special anointing. If you have the Holy Spirit, which is the anointing, you have everything. You have it. Why is that so funny? <laughs> all right all right so so pastor rusta how do we how do we obtain it you have it you just need to learn how to dish it out dish it out it's inside here you just dish it up amen all right first first john i john 2 4 through 6 first john 2 4 through 6 he who says i know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him but whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him, or complete in him. By this we know that we are in him, that he who says he abides in him ought himself walk just as he walked. I have a longer teaching than this, but I want to show you that when Jesus said, these things you're going to do and greater. So what Jesus did, we can do. Amen. Because he gave his power and authority to us. He's the son, but we are sons. And we have the same ability that he has. Not only does Christ live in us, the Holy Spirit, come on. The Holy Spirit lives in us, and he can do miraculous things. Uh, 1 John 4, 17, the love, love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness. Somebody say boldness. boldness. In the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. All right, I'm going to step out on a limb here. Not a limb, but I'm gonna, we need to think a certain way. So as he is, so are we in this world. How, how is he? He's perfect. So 
what I, what I kind of want to bring to the table is, all right, in the Gospels, Jesus was, he's God in the flesh. He died on the cross, raised from the dead, seated at the heavenly, in the heavenly next to, to the Father. Amen? So when we, when, a lot of times when we think about, all right, as Jesus is, so am I in this world, we have this picture of, you know, the, the long-haired Jesus with the, you know, Jonathan Remy with the, uh, you know, the chosen or the, the lamb over the shoulders. And there's a picture that we have of who Jesus is. That's the Gospels, Jesus. However he looked. I don't know how he looked. He was a tan, dark-haired Jewish guy. I don't know. That's not how he is now. How is he now? Book of Revelation says he has a golden sash. His feet are burning and his eyes are afire. There's a description of how Jesus is. So that's actually the Jesus that we're born again after. Because when did Jesus die on the cross? 2,000 years ago. When were you born? I was born in 1968. So I wasn't born again after the one of the Gospels. I was born again after the one of Revelation. Come on. Got to preach right there. That's free right there. That's a, that's a free nugget right there. So as what I want you to think is, how is Jesus now? He's seated at the right hand of the Father, and he looks and presents a certain way. That's who you're born again after. Amen? Amen. And you're going to walk just as he walked. And so as he is, so are we in this world. John 14, I assure you, most solemnly I say to you, anyone who believes in me, raise your hand if you believe in him, will also do the things that I do. So what did Jesus do? All those cool things. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils, make disciples. Sound like the Great Commission? Yep. And he will do even greater things. Ah, oh, you can send an email and get somebody healed. That's pretty cool. You can talk on the phone and get somebody healed. That's pretty cool. So that, that, there's, no, there's no limit. And he'll do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. And what I do, whatever you ask in my name, man, I can ask a lot. He said, whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, so that the Father may be glorified and celebrated in the Son. When you pray for people and they are healed, two things happen. The Father is glorified, and there's a scripture that says you're filled with joy. The Father is glorified when people are healed, and you're filled with joy. Um, I was at the Kroger down here. This is years ago when I was first. I started seeing people healed. It was somewhat natural in a sense, kind of popcorn this, here, there, a little there, you know, things here and things there. And I heard, um, I forget what teaching it was, but he's like, uh, challenge yourself. Challenge yourself in the sense of when you pray for somebody, have them do something they couldn't do, move around, uh, do something. And to me, that was a huge. I didn't want to, I was okay with praying for somebody. I'd pray for somebody and kind of run away, you know, that kind of thing. And then I was like, well, I need to stick around and see if they actually get healed and then push it more. And when you push it more and more bold in a sense of I'm not backing down, I'm going to stay here and have them do something more, you're going to see even more. And so when that happened, and I'll share it in just a second, when that happened, everything just kind of took off even more because I expected it. And I pushed it. So I was at Kroger, and at the time they had, you know, the cashiers, there was like a cashier leader. I don't even know. There's a person, there was a lady there, and she had a brace on, and she was like directing people to what cashier thing to go to. This is before the self checkouts were a big thing. So, um, so I, I, I just walked up to her and I said, Hey, I like praying for people. I see that you have a brace. Can I pray for you? What do you have? And it took her a second, like, most people don't expect you're going to pray like right there. So I was like, can I pray for you right now? And she's like, yeah, that's fine. So I just grabbed her hand. I grabbed the brace hand and I prayed. I said, in Jesus' name. And she said it was carpal tunnel. I said, carpal tunnel, go right now in Jesus' name. And I just let go. And her eyes got big. And I said, can you take the brace off and move your hand around? And she did. She said, when you prayed, fire went through my hand and the carpal tunnel left. She said that right then. It was an instant healing. And she, it turned out she was a believer. But that, that seems simple. But to me at that time, me asking her to take the brace off and move her hand, that was a huge step for me. It really was. Now it's just it's common. But for me, that was a big... And you're going to find yourself as you're praying for people, there's different steps or plateaus that you're going to hit that just kind of catapult you into the next thing because your boldness, your courageousness, I guess it's the same thing, your, how comfortable you are, um, you're just going to push yourself to do more. 
So when you do see a dead body, it's like, oh, Pastor Russell prayed for somebody, and you're just going to be ready in a sense of, I can do this. It doesn't matter what's going on, and I can, no matter what the results are, I can do it. Don't be hung up on results. God, let God deal with the results. You're going to get results. He, what, ple what pleases God? Anybody know? Praise. Faith. Not success, not results, faith. So as you're praying for people, no matter what happens, if they're healed, not healed, healed instantly, healed two days later, your faith is what pleases him. So in all this, look for results, but be pleasing to him. He's commanded you to do it. He's equipped you to do it. So when you go do it, you're pleasing him. This bottom line, you're pleasing him when you're doing those things. Amen? Amen? Alrighty. All right, go to John 20, 21. Jesus said to them again, Peace to you, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. So how did the Father send Jesus? This, this, this is not complicated, y'all. Preach the gospel, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils, disciple people, usher in the kingdom of God, all those things. He says, Peace to you, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. So how has the Father sent y'all? You're going to go heal the sick and raise the dead and cast out devils and make disciples. That's what he's sending you to do. Just as the same, that's why Jesus is the perfect example of what we need to do. How he did it is how we do it. What he did, we did. Because we're in him, he's in us. We have the same commission, we have the same orders, we have the same command, we have the same power of the Holy Spirit to go do these things. Amen? Amen. All right, Ephesians, and this is a big one right here Ephesians 3.20. Pastor Russell, how does this work? I'm about to tell you. I haven't told you in the last hour and a half. All right. Ephesians 3.20. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we... At, just stop right there. Man, that's a big promise right there. So he is able to do what? Exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ask. I can think a lot of things. I, can, I have a lot of big dreams. I can think a lot of big stuff. He, he can exceed that. According, how does all that work? According to the power that falls out of heaven when you worship enough. It says it right here. According to the power that works in us. Lay hands on yourself appropriately. Just, just put it there. Or, it says out of you, actually on your stomach. It says out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. Don't you feel that? The heat. That is the Holy Ghost. Sorry, I'm just having a personal revival up here. All right, um, so <laughs> according to the power that works in us. So how does the power work? How does healing work? According to the power that works in us. It's not something that falls out of heaven because the day of Pentecost already happened. He already poured his spirit into us. So where does the healing come from? Within us. That's why when you touch somebody, the Holy Spirit comes out and touches them when you, or speak to it, the same thing. So it's, it's in us. It all goes back to sovereignty and is God in control. Well, he's given you control and power to do these things. So if you see a sick person, get them healed. Don't ask God to do something he's already told you to do. T.L. Osborne, come on. You may know who T.L. Osborne is. Amazing dude. Anyway, uh, so, all right. To the power, uh, to him be glory in the church and all this. All right, so that, that's what, what, so underline that. According to the power that works in us. Many times we're trying to go to services or do stuff and trying to call like fire out of heaven on the stuff or the Holy Spirit just you know rain down and um, just saturate us and heal people. That's not the prescribed way of doing it. So we've already gone over the prescribed way. A little carrot or caveat to this. Um, in the book of Corinthians, that's where we see the gifts of the Spirit. And that's probably another big question is what's, what are the gifts of the Spirit and why does it seem different than what you're talking about? When you read the book of Corinthians, Paul said, you are not mature, but carnal. I can only give you milk. I can't give you meaty, big, important things. You don't understand this because you're carnal. So they had the Spirit of God flowing through them. They were prophesying and healing and doing all these manifestations, but they didn't have the maturity level to do it properly. So that's why there's so many <clears throat> excuse me, instructions to them. When you prophesy, just one person... If there's interpretation, great. One person, one, just do it in order. We can't hear everybody. Imagine everybody getting up and just start speaking in tongues and prophesying. 
I can't hear what you're saying. No one can get edified because it's just crazy. And that's what was happening. So he's like, settle down. Each person speak in order and by himself, and if there's a word, etc. So there's a way that he talked to the Corinthians because they were carnal. That's where we get the spiritual gifts from. If you read in, <clears throat> excuse me, I think it's chapter 13. It's not in my notes. Uh, this is just a side thing because I, I can hear the questioning in, in my spirit, which is fine. Um, so spiritual gifts is it's a, not different. It's a lower, lower manifestation of the Holy Spirit. And what I mean by that is God wants us to walk in the fullness of the Holy Spirit. The gifts, actually the word gift is not in the Greek. It just says spiritual manifestations. So the Holy Spirit's going to manifest himself as needed. I don't like using this analogy, but it's really good. Anybody ever have a Swiss Army knife? You know, the little red knife that has all the tools? That is, and Sebastian raised his hand. <coughs> Excuse me. That is an illustration of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the gift of the Father, it is this. It is the Swiss Army knife. Now, the manifestation of the Holy Spirit is going to manifest as needed. A corkscrew, a screwdriver, a whatever it is, whatever the job is, he's going to manifest that thing. Word of knowledge, healing, power, whatever it is. Does that make sense? So if you have the Holy Spirit in you, you have the gift of the Father, and you can walk in all the gifts of the Spirit because He lives inside of you. And I can go through and prove all those things. We're not going to do that now. And we can walk them out and prove the will of God. But I want you to see that don't think of a gift like this person has a special gift. Pastor Russell has a special gift to heal. I just have the Holy Spirit, and I'm just exercising that, as any believer can do. So it's not a special anointing. It's just I'm operating in working my muscles, spiritual muscles, in a sense, to do these things. Where was I going with that? So the Holy Spirit is the gift, and he'll manifest as needed. So don't think gift, think fullness, the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Amen? All right, so how does it work? The Holy Spirit's in you, and he comes out of you in a sense of what is needed. A person needs healing, they get physically healed. They need deliverance, they get delivered. They need the born again experience, they get the born again experience. They need a word of wisdom, you give them a word of wisdom. They need a word of knowledge, they get a word of knowledge. You need discernment, you have discernment. All these things work like you. Anybody exercise and work out? Luke and I were working out this morning, we were dragging a tire. It is the most god awful thing. Isn't it horrible? But we are so much stronger for doing that because we're working our muscles and our endurance and our, does all this make sense? Perseverance to do these things, to be stronger in these things. So not only does your physical body have, can exercise, more importantly, you're, you should spiritually exercise. So when you go pray for, pray for people for healing, you're exercising that part of your spiritual being. Uh, same with, you know, I just said all the other things. So whether it's uh, tongues or discernment or words of knowledge, these things just don't just happen. You have to develop them. And that's why the fivefold ministry is there to help develop these things. Once all the believers can do these things, the fivefold ministry is done with. So if your aim is to be a fivefold minister, you're aiming way too low. Fivefold ministry is the foundation. They build the body of Christ up. And when the body of Christ reaches its full maturity, they're gone because they're not needed anymore, because the body of Christ can operate fully as a mature son, just like Jesus. So, so what are you aiming for? I'm already there. I'm a believer. That is the highest calling. If I had a little badge or a name tag or something like that, it's not going to be pastor. It's not going to be evangelist. It's not going to be apostle. I could literally care less about those things. If I'm a believer, then I can do all those things, walk in maturity, walk in humility, because everything I do, you can do. Because I'm just a believer just like you. I just chose and heard a message, and I ran with it. I pay the price, looking like a fool, but I don't care, because now I can, I can perform it and do it. But it does take a price. There's a, there's a, the Amplified says that it's a high cost. Are you willing to pay that? I am. I'm going to. 
kind of quiet in here. All right, so are you willing to pay the price? Are you willing to drag tires like Luke and I? Ha, ha. Give him a hand clap. Because <laughs> there's nobody else out there but me and him. So he chose to go do that. And it, it <laughs> it's horrible, but I'm sure tomorrow he's going to feel better. Anyway, I don't mean to pick on him, but I enjoy our time together and, and training. So anyway, all right, so Ephesians 3.20. Highlight that whole thing. That's how it works. Part two, Wonder Twin Powers Activate. Shape of Hebrew 6. I'm really showing my age with that cartoon. All right, Hebrews, this guy's laughing. All right, Hebrews 6, 11 through 12. The form of, is like a water and then like an animal. So shape of a water bottle. Form of a hawk, or I forget what it was. Remember Hong Kong Fooey? Hong Kong Fooey, number one super guy. Hong Kong Fooey. Quicker than a human eye. Oh, we're on. Every 25 and under is like, what are you talking about? All right. <laughs> Hebrews 6. All right, this is part two to that. So how does it work? Here we go. We, we already talked about this earlier. And we desire that each of you show the same diligence, touch your neighbor and say, diligence, to fulfill... To the full assurance of hope until the end, that you—they're still laughing. I'm a joke, and that you not become sluggish. So, if not pulling a tire, you sluggish. You're sitting there watching, eating Doritos, and watching Netflix. But imitate those who, through faith and patient endurance, inherit the promises. Is healing a promise? Yes. Is dead raising a promise? Yes. Is casting out devils a promise? How do you get that? Through faith and patient endurance. Do you, raise your hand if you believe in Jesus. You have all the faith that you're going to have. You just need to make that faith that you have more effective. Exercise. Exercise. There's way, there's, that's a whole other teaching of how you do these things, but you kind of get the gist. Faith and, so put faith to the side. You have all the faith. Patient endurance. Uh, if it was just patience, um, be like, I, I don't get it. But there's a reason why it's patient endurance. If you look it up in Greek, patient endurance. You endure, you push, you keep going. So when you're praying for somebody, pray for them. They got cancer, cancer go in Jesus' name. Uh, you come back a week later, they still got cancer. What do you do? Throw your hands up and run to the hills? No, you patient endurance. Pray for them again. Pray for them again. Pray for them again. Pray for them again. Every time you're praying for somebody, it's working and you're adding life. What you're, what you're really doing to somebody, whether they're dead or sick, you're giving them Holy Spirit life. That's really what you're doing. And when you hear me pray a lot of times, I'll just say life, life, life. I don't care what you have. Life, life, life. Life, life in Jesus' name. The thing knows what to do. It needs to leave. And the body needs to be healed. It knows that. So that's what patient endurance. Keep hammering that thing. And I forget where I get this illustration, but when I talk about that, when I, what prayer is for healing, prayer is if you had a sledgehammer and you're trying to hit this rock, like a big rock, how many times does it take for you to take that sledgehammer and hit that rock for it to be crushed or cracked? No idea. It might take one, boom, and it's cracked and pulverized. It might take 20 times. I don't know. How many times does it, Pastor Russell, how many times will it take for you to pray for me to be healed? I have no idea. I don't know. I don't have an answer for you. What I'm going to do is sledgehammer that thing until it cracks and is pulverized. That's what's going to happen. And so that's the picture you need to have. When you're praying for somebody, I'm going to pray until this thing cracks. I'm going to outlast it. I'm going to, I'm going to keep hitting it. That makes sense? So faith and patience. So um, highlight those two. Those are two big ones that really helped me through a lot of this. Uh, Ephesians 3.20 and Hebrews 6, 11 through 12. All right. Um, on my session, we have one more scripture, and we'll answer some questions and probably finish out. All right, 2 Corinthians 1.20. For all the promises of God in him are yes, and, and in him amen, to the glory of God through us. So is healing a promise? You're going to hear the yes. same thing over and over from me. Is healing a promise? Yes. Yes. Is dead raising a promise? Yes. yes. Is casting out devils a promise? Yes. yes. Can God ever say no to that? No. No. He's never going to say no. 
when Jesus died on the cross and was whipped, it's like a, you, the light switch was permanently put on. It's not like um, God's looking down. This goes back to the control and sovereignty. He's not looking down from heaven and saying, you know, Luke, you're really good today. You did all A, B, C, and 1, 2, 3, and 1 through 10. You're going to get healed. Renee, I, I saw what you did today. And so I'm not going to heal you. All right. Laurie, you were really good today. You read your Bible. You prayed enough. I'll, I'll heal you. Suzanne? But that, that is how we think. That's, that's, that's the law. That's Old Testament thinking. When Jesus died on the cross, what did he take? Or when he was whipped, what did he take? He took our sickness and sin and disease, and he permanently put the light switch to on. He's always saying yes. All the promises of God are yes and amen. Does God want to heal me? Yes. Is, does God, when I'm praying for somebody, does God want that person to heal? Yes. yes. Why? Why do you think that? It's in the Word. It's not only is it paid legally through His blood, He said, yes, by my stripes, you were healed. You were healed, you are healed, you is healed. So you go deliver it. It's that simple. Amen? Yeah, amen. All right. Um, how did Jesus do it? We talked about that. He spoke to it. And he touched them. Um, all right. That, that's probably good enough for now, and that's actually the end of my notes. So um, write down on your index card any questions that pertain to anything to healing, power, Holy Ghost, stuff like that. Um, and if you raise your hand if you have a verbal question, if you want to ask any questions. Yes. This is Brother McGrad. All right, so I'll read this don't, one. Don't repeat this, but don't worry about <sighs> this. I think you should. It, it's, it's not exactly... Just can you do that? Do you mean to read it? Yeah. It's right. not exactly healing related, but I'd like, if you don't mind answering it, it's going to go to Okay. All right. Raise your hand if you have a verbal question. This light is like, and if you come up with one later, it's fine. I'll read the card. All right. People often say the reason. Do the other one first. Do the other one first. Okay. All right. What does the Bible say about? Defending yourself or defending your family in a godly way? You're going to have to expound on that. I don't know what they're asking. Like in the natural, physically? Do you really want me to answer that? <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. All right. I pause because I have to come up with Scripture because they're asking for Scripture. And I, but I can tell you what I think because I have my own opinion of how God made us and how the world kind of works. All right. And until the Lord gives me a specific scripture, I'll have to go with common sense. All right. God gave us common sense. This, all right. Apart from our teaching, and this is scripture, and this is I can prove this out, this is my opinion, and this is how I think, and this is how I operate. All right. This is my, this is me. And what I think the Bible and what God intends. All right, everybody good with it? All right, so uh, I have to give extreme examples. And I've been in a lot of different situations. So I have a family. Laura and I are married. We have three kids, animals in our house. If someone breaks into my house, I'm, I'm going to try to say it in the nicest way. I will stop you. And they'll probably have to bring a body bag. I'm, I'm going to say that in the nicest way. Um, God gave us common sense. He, he's created me as a father to protect those around me. And some of the scriptures that pop up is love God and love others. If someone breaks into my house, I'm not going to let that person do anything to my family because I love my family. If I'm at Walmart or the mall and an active shooter comes in, I'm going to take them out. Do you understand me? That's what's going to happen because I love those around me and I love and I'm, I'm made to be a protector. But what about the what about the thief or the burglar? Don't they need to hear the gospel? If I have time to share the gospel before I pulverize them, then that's do you see what I'm saying? I'm not trying to be mean, 
But I will, God wants us to protect our families. Now, whether you believe in guns or not, I, I believe in guns, but I believe in a self-defense way. I'm certainly not going to go out there and do something bad, but I, I feel the responsibility to love those around me and protect those around me with whatever means necessary. So I, I, I carry guns because I'm going to protect those around me. First, I put God first. I will pray in tongues. I will command the person. At the same time, probably pulling the trigger. I, and I say that because I'm in America, and this is a long answer to a short question. I'm going to do what is needed. And those are a couple of scriptures. When I lived in Israel, we lived in a very violent place. We did not carry guns, although we could have. My pastor was a former Special Forces IDF soldier who was an assassin. He didn't carry guns. We didn't carry guns. We could have, but we chose not to because the, the, the first time we would, we, if we ever used guns, the entire village would come down and execute us. That's what was going to happen. So we chose not to use guns. We used prayer. We got beat up. I almost died. I have my C6s broken. I've been poisoned. I'm still here. So I, I've been there. So I don't know how more to answer that question. He's given us common sense. And he's given us natural rights. So our, the, the people who framed our Constitution and our Bill of Rights knew that there was a God and there was natural rights. If I just parachuted from wherever down to earth, I have a natural right to life. And I have a natural right to defend myself. Anybody agree with that? That's, in, that's inside of us. God has given us those things to preserve our life. Okay, How far you go with that in protection is really up to you. I know what I'm willing to do to protect my family and those around me, but that is, that's your walk with the Lord. And the terms murder and killing are different. If you go to war, you're killing. If you, that's why there's murder one, two, and three. If you intentionally murder someone, obviously that's bad. So there, there is a difference of, of thinking. So I'm not saying go, go to the military and go to war, but if you do go to the military and you're in a war and you have to kill the enemy, it's okay. Okay? I don't know how long to beat that dead horse, but um, <laughs> right, it really goes back to loving God and loving those around you. And he's given men, I just I speak to men, fathers, that, that protection assessment in us to, to do those things. Okay? Um, hopefully they answered it. If there's more questions about that, you know, just send them to me. That's my personal bent. It's not, I can't find a whole lot of scripture other than first I'm going to pray. And I've seen it. I've seen when I spoke to something that something happened and something bad didn't happen. But I'm, but I'm also going to, I'm going to carry prayer and I'm going to carry my nine. So it's, the bad thing is going to stop one way or the other. Okay. All right. Can I do the next question? All right. All right. People often say the reason so and so didn't get healed is I can't read it. They didn't have faith or enough faith. What scriptures do they use to back that up? What scriptures negate this false doctrine? That's excellent. So basically, um, when a person uh, didn't get healed. Someone might say they, they didn't have enough faith. And that, that's a valid question. So if you're sick and the person says you don't have enough faith, where does that come from? That comes from false teaching, what I said earlier. In general, when the church has prayed for people, and I say in general, and they don't get healed, people have a false theology. They have to come up with some reason the person didn't get healed. And it's usually to blame something. That person didn't have enough faith. The devil's too big. Uh, there's too much sin in their life. They have a generational curse. All these false things. So this, to say where this comes from, it just comes from a false theology. Again, the, it doesn't matter what the person's faith is if you're the minister. Um, the uh, scriptures that back that up, um, how long do you have? 
we really have to go through the Gospels and see. When you look at the Gospels, who's our perfect picture of how things are done? Jesus. So, half and half. So, half the time he healed or raised the dead or whatever, the person either had some faith, a bunch of faith, or in some cases they had all the faith they needed to get healed. The woman who touched the hem of his garment. She decided when. She decided where. She decided who. She decided how. Jesus was oblivious to this happening, other than when she touched them, virtue came. You could feel it. So you can go from all the way to having the person who's sick, having all this faith to do what is needed and get healed, all the way to having no faith, and by the grace of God, because it's not a, gift, it's not a requirement, it's a free gift, God heals them no matter what their faith is. So what I'm saying is when Jesus walked around in the Gospels, people had some faith, a bunch of faith, a little bit of faith, help my faith, or they had none. They were, they were dead. They weren't there. They were just, there, there was no faith. I hope that answers it because that's a good question, but we don't have time to go through all the scriptures. So I, my suggestion is look through the Gospels, look at all the healings of Jesus, and see where the faith was. And most of the time it was Jesus had the faith. But sometimes people had some faith or, you know, it just depends on the situation. Um, does that make sense? Uh, and I can answer that more if it, it's not real clear. Um, all right. Any other questions? I, I can feel them. Y'all got more questions. It, you, you're not going to throw me. I've had all the questions. I have heard all the questions. I've had all the questions. So there's nothing outside the box that is going to surprise me. Should we do... It's, what time is it? Uh, okay, we probably need to wrap up with the teaching and then pray for people. How about that? How about we do that? So any last questions on... It can be on anything. It doesn't have to be on what we talked about necessarily, but Holy Spirit, power of God, things like that. These are really good questions, and we'll, we'll, answer, them, we'll answer them more uh, tomorrow as we get a little bit deeper. Facebook Live tomorrow, 9 to 12. Eastern Standard Time. Three more sessions. The last one's more of an activation. Answer questions. How do you approach people? Get y'all going. Things like that. So, Amen.